Amen. Going to ask our brother, Mr. Julian Patterson, a first year theological student from our Cumber Convocation, to come now and read to us the Word of God. Hello, it's good to be here. And this morning we're just going to look at a familiar portion, David and Goliath, and that's found in 1 Samuel chapter 17. So if you turn with me, please, in the Word of God to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And we'll read the verses 38 down to the verse 51. So 1 Samuel chapter 17, the verses 38, reading down to the verse 51. The Bible tells us, And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, and ruddy, and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog, that thou commandest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air, and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Verse 46, This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee, and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the, the army to meet the Philistine. Verse 49, And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it, and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone, the stone sunk in his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and, took upon, and, and stood upon the Philistine, and took his sword, and drew it out of the sheath thereof, and slew him, and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Amen. And we know that God will bless his word to each of our hearts. Thank you. Our preacher this morning is Mr. David Stewart. And of course, he is no stranger to you. And there's no need to introduce him, which is a pity because I shared a room with our brother in college for two years. There are many, many ways in which I could introduce him. And I'm sure if somebody else here was leading this morning, you could have many things to say about our brother. But we are not going to say anything. He has the final word after all. And he could say plenty about me. But we're going to ask him now to come and to bring the word the Lord has laid upon his heart. We trust the Lord will bless him and that the Lord would even speak to us today as his servant brings his word to us. Thank you, Andrew, and it was his misfortune to live with us and to share with us in those two years. I remember the night that I hid behind the curtain, and I thought the rapture had taken place because I jumped out, and Andrew was halfway to glory whenever he saw me bouncing out behind the curtains. But we thank the Lord for him and for our service together with the Lord. If you're surprised to see me here, You're not as surprised as when I was and whenever I looked at the list 
to see my name was here. Usually it happened that you didn't preach in your home congregation, but the lot has fallen to me. Rules have now changed, and you have to put up with me this morning. But I know that I've got a very sympathetic congregation with me this morning and before me. Second Samuel chapter 17 is where we're going to base some of our thoughts. Let's open the Word of God again and briefly bow in prayer, please. 1 Samuel 17, but let's bow in prayer. Our Father, we thank Thee for an opportunity to gather into this house again and to open Thy Word. And we pray that Thou wilt grant to us the help that is required in the bringing forth of Thy Word. We pray that Thou wilt fill us with Thy Spirit and with Thy power. Shut us in with God, we pray. Take away all distracting thoughts. May the Christ of God be glorified in our midst. May there be a word in season for every waiting heart. We pray that Christ and Christ alone may be glorified. So fill us with thy spirit and with thy power. We ask this for Christ's eternal praise and glory. Amen and amen. The battle lines had been drawn and the armies had been set in array. For 40 days, morning and evening, the champion of the Philistine had belched out his despicable blasphemies against the God of heaven unchecked. Saul, Israel's king, had gone into hiding, whilst there was not found a man amongst Israel's battalions to go out and fight against Goliath of Gath. It was into this scene of impending defeat that a shepherd boy on an errand from his father would step into. That shepherd boy, whose name was David, heard the challenge of Goliath and, realizing that there was a cause, volunteered his services to king and country. Now it is true that David began that day an unknown within the realm of Israel. But by nightfall, his name would echo and re-echo around her cities and villages and towns as the woman would sing, Saul has slain his thousands, David his ten thousands. The day of Goliath's demise was going to be the day of David's advancement. But before David was ever to be advanced by God, he first had to confront and then conquer his Goliath. Someday, you will face a Goliath in your life. That Goliath will not be 11 feet, 4 inches tall and standing before you in gleaming, gleaming armor, but, but a Goliath nonetheless. It may be the Goliath of fear, a Goliath of worry or anxiety. It may be the Goliath of intimidation, failure, guilt, slander. The Goliath of depression, bereavement, or sorrow. It may be that a Goliath of health difficulties will stand in your way. It may be the Goliath of marital problems, a hospital operation, a crucial exam, or a critical job interview. It may be that this week such a Goliath has stood in your way, a Goliath in your home. A Goliath in your workplace, a Goliath at work, a Goliath at university or college. That Goliath has caused your faith in God to evaporate. has caused your walk with God to be paralyzed and has caused you to sit down in defeat and despair just like Israel's king and his armies, wondering how on earth am I ever going to topple this Goliath? In such times when we stand toe-to-toe with the giants of life, there are certain things that God would have us to remember. That's what we want to speak to you for the remaining moments that we have together. What to remember when you come against your Goliath. What to remember when you come against your Goliath. The first thing to remember when you come up against your Goliath is you must remember that you cannot avoid your Goliaths. You must confront them. Now, for 40 days, Israel had been trying to avoid confrontation with this giant from Gath. 
However, putting their head in the sand like the proverbial ostrich did not cause the problem to disappear. In actual fact, inaction on Israel's part caused the problem to get worse. We notice these or that thought from the verse number 8 of this chapter, 1 Samuel 17, verse 8. We're going to read it, but before we do so, let's read the verse number 3 to get the, the topography or the shape of the country. It tells us there that the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, and there was a valley in between them. So you need to place yourself into the picture of where we are. Israel's camp on one side, the Philistines' camp on the other side, and a valley in between. Now let us notice the words of what Goliath says in the verse number 8. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, and said unto them, Why are ye come to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you out a man for you, and let him come down to me. It is those words, let him come down to me. To me. Let him come down to me. You need to underline those words. Let him come down to me. In other words, what Goliath was saying, let your champion descend from the slopes that he occupies. I'll descend the slopes that I occupy. We'll meet in the valley of Elah and then we'll fight to the death. Now I want you now to notice the words of the verse 25. Remembering in verse number 16 that 40 days have elapsed from the verse number 8 to the verse number 25. It tells us in verse 16, And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. Now let's notice what the men of Israel say. They're speaking to David here. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that is come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. Something has happened between the intervening period of the verse number 8 and the verse number 25, and it was this. Goliath grew bolder every day. In actual fact, every day, those 40 days, Goliath took the territory of Israel. In other words, he descended the slopes day by day. He had now crossed over the valley of Elah, and he was coming up the side that Israel was occupying. Israel was learning this lesson, that if you tolerate a Goliath in your life, he will take the territory from you. If you allow a Goliath, a giant of fear, worry, depression, sorrow, bitterness, whatever it is, if you allow that Goliath into your life, he will rob you of the territory that you should be possessing as a child of God. This is how Satan works in the life of a believer. If we tolerate a Goliath, a giant in our life, or the sin that he allures us with, he will take ground of us that we, by God's grace, have conquered in our past Christian walk. Satan is a master of subtlety and craft. He will incrementally advance into our lives. Slowly but surely, as a child of God, he will get himself entrenched into the life of the child of God. And oft times that occurs undetected by the child of God. He does this by firstly establishing a toehold in the believer's life. And whenever he gets that toehold established in the believer's life, he then moves on to setting up a, or establishing a foothold. And whenever he's got a foothold in the believer's life, then he moves on to setting up a stronghold. Toehold, foothold, stronghold. We have examples of that in God's word. Let me give you but two. Eve, in the book of Genesis, in the chapter number three, we read that she was tempted to look at the forbidden fruit. She put her eyes, set her eyes upon the forbidden fruit. That was the toehold. And then she began, after looking at it, she then began to desire it. That was the foothold. And then she took of it. That was the stronghold. 
Or to take another example, David, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, he first of all glanced at Beersheba as she bathed on the rooftop. That was the toehold. That gaze then developed, or that glance then developed into a gaze. That was the foothold that he eventually led him to committing adultery with another man's life. That was the stronghold. Toehold, foothold, stronghold. In 711 AD, the Moors, an Islamic army made up of the Berbers from Africa and the Arabs, invaded Spain and finished nearly conquering the entire peninsula. The Christian kingdoms in the north began the long and slow recovery of that peninsula, a progress or a process that concluded in 1492 with the fall of Grenada. Now, despite the Moors taking only a few years to almost conquer the peninsula of Spain, it took them 781 years to expel the Muslims. I believe that there's a lesson from that historical event, and it's this. Whenever you allow Satan into your life, you'll find that it'll take you much longer to get him ousted. You'll find that it'll take you much longer to get him ousted out of your life. You'll find that expulsion is much harder than inclusion. That's why James tells us, as God's people, Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In the Word of God, we read of a man who resisted the enemy's advancement into his inheritance and into his territory. His name was a man by the name of Shammah, and we find his story recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 23. Let's turn there. Just two verses. 2 Samuel 23. Now David here is cataloging his mighty men. It's his gallery of heroes, we would say. And he's listing them, all these men that helped him throughout his reign. And we're going to read about Shammah here from the verse number 11. 2 Samuel 23, 11. And after him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Hararite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop there was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it, and slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. The Philistines had again advanced into Israel's inheritance and territory. And Israel's armies, as they had done in David's day, had fled. But here we find a man that stands in the midst of a field full of lentil beans. Now, we must bring to your attention that this man did not decide to strategically or to defend a strategic city. He didn't decide to defend Jerusalem or Bethlehem. He didn't decide uh, to defend Jericho or some of the cities within the territory of Israel. No, this man decided that he was going to stand in a field of lentil beans. Now, we must ask ourselves the question, why did this man decide to stand in a field of lentil beans, such an insignificant plot of land? And really, that which was in the land was not very valuable at all. It was only going to be used for a mess of pottage, as we read about Jacob and Esau, it's the same type of thing, the lentils. Why, why did he do that? Well, the reason was quite simple. Shammah realized that if the enemy triumphed here, that today it would be the field. Tomorrow it would be the farm. The next day would be the fortified cities. Today the field, tomorrow the farm the next day, the fortified cities. Give the enemy an inch, and they'll take a mile. And as God's people, we are to give no place whatsoever to the devil. None whatsoever. 
Because if you give the devil a toehold in your life, that may well develop into a foothold that will eventually lead to a stronghold in your existence as a Christian. Whenever the Goliaths of life appear on life's horizon, there are only two ways in which we can respond. We can respond either like Israel's armies of whom we read off in the verse chapter of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17 and the verse 24. We can respond like the men of Israel where it tells us when they saw the man, they fled from him and they were sore afraid. We can respond in that way or we can respond like David responded whenever he saw Goliath. His response is given at the end of the verse 48. It tells us that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Child of God, God would have us. When the Goliaths of life appear on life's horizon, God would have us to confront our Goliaths in the name and in the power of God. And let me say to you that God has given to you, as God's child, all pieces of armory, all weaponry that you require to topple life's giants. He's given to you the Christian armor of Ephesians chapter 6. And let me say to you, that armor has been proven and has been tested down through the ages by many saints of God. There's none like it. In actual fact, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We have the Christian armor. But child of God, to topple your Goliath, you also have the person and the power of the Holy Spirit living within you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And let me say to you that the promises within this book assures you of ultimate victory. If God be for us, who can be against us? God would have us to confront our Goliaths. The second thing that you are to remember, when you come up against the Goliaths of life, you must remember that God may use unconventional means to topple your Goliath. God may use unconventional means to topple your Goliath. There are times when we face the giants of life that God will use the most unconventional means that you possibly thought for God to topple and to destroy the Goliath that stands in your way. In this incident, I want you to consider the man that God used. Consider the man that God used to defeat Goliath of Gath. Now, logically, from a human viewpoint, you would have thought that a war-decorated soldier would have been the man to go out and beat this giant from Gath. Someone that was an expert in war. Someone that knew how to, as it were, devise and to strategically place himself within the battle. Maybe someone who was a master swordsman. Someone that knew what it was to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the enemy. Someone that was a war-decorated soldier. You would have thought that God would have used a man like that. But I want you to remember, God wasn't looking for a soldier. God was looking for a shepherd. God wasn't looking for a soldier. God was looking for a shepherd. Now, David had no experience on the field of battle, but he had plenty of experience on the fields and the farm. God was going to use that experience with what he had. He tries the armor. It's no good to him, Saul's armor. And so he goes out quite content to meet this enemy as a shepherd, not as a soldier. God was going to use a shepherd to destroy the enemy. Whenever I think about that, I thought about the Lord Jesus Christ, David's greater son. He's described for us in the Word of God as being the chief, the good, the great shepherd. 
Whenever we become Christians, whenever you're born again, converted, with whatever terminology you want to use, whenever you become a born-again believer, something wonderful happens in your life. You become eternally and indissolubly linked and united to Jesus Christ. That union that we have with Jesus Christ is described for us in the Word of God using different imagery. It's described as the vine with the branch. Christ the vine, we're the branch. It's described as the head with the body, the union that exists between the head, Christ, who is our head, and we who are the members of God's body. It's described as being the foundation and the building that's built upon it, Christ the foundation. And we're built as lively stones into the edifice that is the church of Jesus Christ. This imagery is all imagery that's used to describe the union that we enjoy with Jesus Christ. And this morning, if you're a child of God, you are In Jesus Christ, you are united to Jesus Christ. And because of that union that exists between you and Jesus Christ, you meet your Goliaths in Christ. You meet your Goliaths in Christ. That Goliath of fear, whenever it appears on life's horizon, You don't need to fear and you don't need to face that Goliath alone because you're united to Jesus Christ. This is a wonderful thing. This is the key to successful Christian living, to know your relationship that you have with Jesus Christ. I am united to him and because of that, divine omnipotence, divine omnipotence accompanies me whenever I go out to face life's giants. Now, because of that, consider the one that you're united to. Consider his record. Consider Christ's record on the field of battle. The one that you're in this morning, in Jesus Christ. Consider his record. Every every enemy that Christ has ever come up against, he has triumphed over them gloriously. Every enemy, every arena of battle that Jesus Christ ever entered into came out the other end as a victor. Every arena. At the Colosseum at Calvary, there at the cross, Jesus Christ triumphed over the Goliaths of sin, death, hell, and the devil. Christ, he is the victor. And because you are united to him, his victory becomes your victory. By faith, you can stand into that victory. You can share in his triumphs. You don't need to be overcome by sin because you share in Christ's victory. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Child of God, I've already triumphed over that. The Word of God tells us, but thanks be on to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans 8, verse 37, it tells us, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. By faith we stand into his triumphs and we share in his victories. The man that God used, God would use a shepherd. The means that God used, It was but a stone, just a simple stone that was found in the brook down there in the valley of Elah. That's all that God was going to use. He wasn't going to use some sophisticated armory. He wasn't going to use some weapon. He was just going to use a small stone. You wouldn't have thought that God would have done that, but he did. Because sometimes God uses the most unconventional means and methods to win the victory. Now you may ask, well, what will God use? By what means can I triumph over the Goliath that I'll meet this week? How can I gain the victory? How can I live a victorious Christian life? By what weapons does, has God given me that I can triumph and see the Goliath of life topple and fall before me? 
Well, God gives us his word, his precious word. I have written on to you, young men, because ye are strong and the word of God abideth in you and ye have overcome the wicked one. 1 John 2 verse 14. Through the word of God and through the victory of the cross, because they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony and love, not their lies even on to the death. As you sit in this house this morning, you're maybe thinking about something that you have to meet this week. Something that you have to go through. And you're maybe thinking in your mind, well, well, how will I ever, how will I ever see a Goliath fall in front of me? You may wonder, I've tried to work it out in my head and I just can't see any way ahead. I want you to remember, child of God, Whenever you don't think that there's any way, whenever you don't think that there's any way ahead, I want you to remember that God still has a thousand ways in which he can work on your behalf. The final thing to remember when you come against your Goliath is this. You need to remember that above and beyond your Goliath is your God. That above and beyond your Goliath is your God. See, that day David's eyes, they they weren't fixed on this giant from Gath. They were higher. They were focused on the God of glory. This young man's vision was not taken up with the problems and the difficulties that lay in front of him. No, his eyes were lifted higher. Lift it towards the throne. Lift it towards his God, his Savior, his Redeemer, his Mediator, his Intercessor. He got his eyes on Christ, on God. As he considered his God, he thought about who his God was. See, the God that this man served, David, was the covenant-keeping God. You may ask, well, how do you know that? Well, I know that because David, on four different occasions between the verses 45 and the verses 47, David uses the covenant name of God as he goes out and fights his Goliath. For he calls him Lord, L-O-R-D, Jehovah, the God of the covenant engagement. That's who he was going out in. Not in his name, sure, who was David? A stripling of a lad, not known within the realm, but he was going out in the name of his God, the covenant-keeping God. And I tell you, David was well-versed in the Bible because he remembered the verse and the promise that this covenant-keeping God made to the nation of Israel in Deuteronomy 20, verses 1 to 4. You can look at that whenever you go home. Let me paraphrase it. God told the children of Israel, you go out to battle, you see an army greater than yourself with horses and chariots. God said to them, don't fear, because I'm going to go out before them, and I'm going to go out before you, and I'm going to save you from your enemies. And here's David, and he's saying, in the name of God, in the name of Jehovah, fulfill your covenant engagement. God is the God of the covenant engagement. You've got a promise for your children. Your Lord will fulfill that word. Ah, but there's something else. Not only who his God was, but where his God was. David's God was in heaven. David's God was on his throne. David's God was above the battle, above the battle. He was ruling and he was reigning as our king. He was bringing all enemies into subjection. God was on his throne. And and in 2012, he's still on his throne. And just as he walked upon the sea billows in Mark chapter 6, and he was above the storm, so in this incident, 
He was above the battle. Let me say to you, child of God, that whatever battle, whatever trial, whatever difficulty you're going through, let me say to you that you need to get your eyes off that battle, off that situation, and you need to see your Savior who's above the battle, above the trial, above the difficulty. Because he reigns. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last thing, what his God was doing, who his God was, where his God was, and what his God was doing. Now David released the stone from the sling. We know that. But God directed it through the air. How do I know that? Because I don't think that David was very confident in his sling shooting. He took five stones and he said, if it doesn't work the first time, it'll work the second. And if not the second, we'll get him the third time. But God directed the stone and saw the champion fall on his face. You find that in God's word. There's something to do this evening. He fell on his face, not on his back, because all enemies that come against Christ always fall on their face because he's the victor. Well, what was God doing for this man? He was, he was working in the battle and he was praying for his child. Whatever battle, whatever difficulty, if you know Christ in a saving way, you can be assured that Christ is praying for you. He's praying for you. There will be a time that a Goliath will appear on life's horizon. It may be this week. What am I to do? Well, you need to remember that you'll not be able to avoid your Goliath. You'll have to confront him in the name of God. And you'll need to remember that whenever you think that you know how God's going to work in, your, in that situation, you're going to have to remember that God may not just work in that way. But whenever you stand toe to toe with your Goliath, you need to look beyond and above that Goliath and you need to look to your God. Because God wants us to be giant killers in our generation. Maybe you're not a Christian. Let me say to you that on life's horizon, three Goliaths are going to appear before you someday. The Goliath of death, the Goliath of hell, and the Goliath of the final judgment. If you're not in Jesus Christ, those Goliaths will conquer you, will triumph over you. And so you need to be found in Jesus Christ. Because if you're not found in Jesus Christ, how great will be your fall? How great will be your fall? May God see us going forward in his name and triumphing gloriously because we're united to Christ our living head. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father, we draw nigh to Thee. We rejoice that Christ is the victor. And because we are seated with Him in heavenly places, we bless thee that all enemies that come on life's horizon, we can conquer through Christ. We ask of thee that thou wilt help us to live the victorious Christian life. We pray that we may see in our generation the giants of apostasy, apathy, materialism, 
fall before our great champion, Christ. May the church of Christ advance in these days like an army with banners unfurled to the breeze. Be with us in the rest of thy day, and as we serve thee, let us do so with gladness. We pray these things in Christ's precious name. Amen and amen.